Rocket Lab had a problem, but it wasn't a problem of failure, it was a problem of success. After its first fully commercial launch in November of 2018, named its business time, what a good name, right? Rocket Lab had proven what few of us could, that they could get to orbit reliably, frequently, and on a budget. And they became the undisputed king of the small launch market. The new space revolution was booming, universities, startups, data companies, they're all building these CubeSats, small constellations. And Rocket Lab was the only dedicated and reliable ride to orbit that these companies had. But then the market dynamics, they started to change. They still are changing. SpaceX is that 800 pound gorilla. It began its transport a ride share program. And for those that haven't heard of this, that's where, hey, I'm not buying a full rocket, but I can strap my small CubeSat to the side of somebody else that's already going up on SpaceX's Falcon 9, and it's a lot cheaper. So suddenly those small satellite operators, they don't need that dedicated $8 million launch from Rocket Lab. They could just ride share on that Falcon 9 for a fraction of the cost. This is a classic commoditization trap. Rocket Lab was facing an existential threat. Competing with SpaceX on price is and will always be a race to the bottom. And it's a race that Rocket Lab was bound to lose. But instead of dying, Rocket Lab executed one of the most brilliant pivots in the industry. They realized the true high margin opportunity was not in launching satellites, but in building them. And so this move transformed Rocket Lab from a launch feature into an end-to-end -end space platform. It's the first and most important lesson from their playbook, escape commoditization trap by owning more of the value chain. So here's how they did it. The space systems division is a two-pronged strategy. First, you've got pillar one. This is the, if you're looking at it from a restaurant point of view, this is the a la carte menu. It started in 2020, Rocket Lab went on a shopping spree. They began acquiring market leaders in critical, hard to build, hard to maintain, high margin satellite components. And why are these components high margin? Because it is not a commodity. These devices require years of R&D. They have to operate in vacuums. They have to survive extreme radiation. And they're built with like one in a million precision. So the barrier to entry on these types of components is immense. At first, key acquisition was a company called Sinclair Interplanetary. They make something that's called a reaction wheel, and they also make these star trackers. Now, these things, if you look at a picture of them, like there's being shown on screen right now, they look very basic, but they're not. They, they take a lot of construction, a lot of finicky bits of, of cutting and precision and all that kinds of stuff to, to be made. And in, in simplest terms, right, these are five, six-figure components that let a satellite navigate space with precision. After that, they bought a company that was called Planetary Systems Corporation, a market leader in satellite separation systems. And this is the critical hardware that, like, unbolts a satellite from the rocket in space. The third one, Advanced Solutions, or ASI, this provides the brains of a, of a mission. This is flight software for guidance, navigation, control, and then in 2022, uh, they bought Solero, one of the world's top producers of high efficiency space grade solar cells, a key supplier to NASA, the Department of Defense and other satellite constellations. And I think worth noting, right, is, is they bought this so that they could use it themselves, but they don't just use it themselves. They sell to competitors, too. So with these pieces, Rocket Lab became a one stop shop for the most valuable parts of a spacecraft. And that brings us to the second lesson, which is the frenemy strategy, right? The, the, the frenemy. Because they sell these components, Rocket Lab wins even when its competitors end up winning that launch contract. So as I'm recording this, uh, we're a couple of days after NASA's escapade mission. And NASA's escapade mission, for example, it, it, it uses a Rocket Lab built spacecraft. They built this spacecraft. They built all the components of it. It's going to Mars. But that spacecraft launched on a Blue Origin rocket. Rocket Lab's Electron cannot send a, a, a spacecraft to Mars. It doesn't have the power, but Blue Origin can. And so Rocket Lab built the spacecraft, and they still make a profit, even though they did not launch this thing in the space. There's also this strong speculation that they're the chief supplier to Amazon's Project Kuiper. Uh, they supply the reaction wheels to Project Kuiper. This is a large constellation that competes with uh, Starlink, so space-based internet. And there's some strong speculation that they're the chief supplier of reaction wheels. Again, six-figure components. More realistically, they're probably five-figure at this scale, but you get what I'm saying. Big components, big, expensive, high-margin components, and Rocket Lab is winning even when others win as well. It's a, a heads-I-win, tails-I-win strategy, and it's a good place to be. The second part of that strategy, though, is, is, is pillar two, right? This is the, the, 
the prefix, if the other one was the, the a la carte, this is the, the set menu. Um, and for customers who don't want to build satellites, Rocket Lab will do it all for them. Uh, they can take all the components that we've already spoke about, all those components from that first pillar, and they can integrate them into its own proprietary satellite platform that they call Photon. So Photon is a highly configurable, what they call a satellite bus. And it's the, it's the main body and brains of a spacecraft, right? It, it comes, the Photon at least comes in several classes. They got a version for low Earth orbit. They've got this Explorer class for deep space. And they've got this Pioneer class for bespoke missions, right? The very custom stuff like Varda's in-space manufacturing. So Varda manufactures drugs in space. They make space drugs. I, mean, I guess they're actually Earth drugs, but they make Earth drugs in space because they have higher yield. Really cool stuff. There's the Lightning class as well, which is a larger platform that's designed for these like really complex constellations. So that Lightning class bus is the one that won uh, yeah, massive contracts from the Space Development Agency and Global Star. So it is something that the industry is buying and, and making good use of. This done for you service is a high margin revenue stream. And it's built from Rocket Lab's own internal expertise. Which brings us to the third lesson, turn your cost centers into profit centers. So Photon was not designed from scratch in a lab. They didn't just say one day, hey, we're going to build a satellite bus. No, it evolved from a piece of hardware that was previously just a cost of doing business. So a rocket has a first stage. That first stage gets the rocket to space. Then there's the second stage that gets the payload close to its destination. And then a third stage or a kick stage, or it goes by a few different names, but you could hear it called a kick stage, a first stage. The kick stage is needed for that final precise orbital insertion of where a satellite or a, a space tool is going. And so it is a component that historically does its job and then it's discarded. The Rocket Lab's engineers looked at this disposable piece of equipment and said, what happens if we add power and add communications, add some propulsion? Could we turn this single-use component into a like long-duration revenue-generating spacecraft? Turns out, yes, and that's exactly what they did. So they productized a cost center. And this R&D as well, it also helps them produce sellable products like their 3D-printed Curie and HyperCurie engines. So HyperCurie is a, a high-performance engine that successfully fired to send NASA's capstone mission to the moon. They'll be using it on Escapade as well. And Curie is a, a smaller counterpart that can be used for precise maneuverability in space. But of course, none of this would be possible without that original innovation. And lesson four is to build the feature that earns you the right to pivot. The Rocket Lab could only make the moves that they made because of the Electron rocket, because Electron was a mastery of innovation. They weren't just another launch company, they were the company that solved problems. The Rutherford engine was the world's first orbital engine that made use of electric pumps. This made it 95% efficient compared to the 50% that you get from a traditional gas generator. And they prefer and they perfected additive manufacturing along the way as well. All the primary components of Rutherford, they're all 3D printed. That allows them to produce a complete engine in about 24 hours. The rocket bodies are not metal. They're actually made of an advanced carbon composite. And they're built by a, a robot named, uh, I think it's Rosie the Robot. R Rosie the Robot makes these bodies in just 12 hours. This is a process that used to take weeks of manual labor. So rocket Lab's DNA is it's a culture of solving hard engineering problems. And that's exactly what gave them the credibility and the cash flow and the interest from outside investors and buyers and companies that are just betting their livelihoods on Rocket Lab, it gave them the credibility to, to make their next big move. And that brings us to the final critical lesson, right? De-risk your business by owning your core dependencies. Because if you know anything about Rocket Lab, you know they're working on a, a rocket called Neutron. And you might ask, if satellites are that high margin future, why would Rocket Lab spend a fortune building a newer, bigger rocket called Neutron? Well, it's because relying on your biggest competitor, in this case SpaceX, to launch your new high margin satellites is a strategic death trap. You don't just risk like the launch fee, you risk giving your competitor a direct relationship with hard won customers. So Neutron is Rocket Lab's plan to own its own destiny but it's also a massive gamble. The, the medium lift market, so this is the Falcon 9 rockets uh, that, that you've seen launching many times, right? This medium lift market, 
is not the small sat market. This is where like the big behemoth, SpaceX's Falcon 9, you've got Blue Origin that's there, you've got uh, a lot of different launch providers that are not coming to mind right now, but you, you have them and they're all trying to get a piece of this pie. There's also those new well-funded competitors like Firefly and, and Terran Art, and they're all fighting for those same contracts. And this is where Neutron has to just excel. It must be reusable, and it must be cheaper. It's being built with a new Archimedes engine, and that runs on methane, burns clean, designed for rapid reusability, matches what we see out of, out of SpaceX. But it also features an, a, a really novel and, and very clever innovation, right? It's called the Hungry Hippo fairing. And a rocket's fairing, so if you imagine a rocket that goes up to space, the fairing is the part that opens up and then the satellites release. Now those big chunks of, of, whether they be metal, carbon fiber, whatever they are, those big chunks of metal are expensive. That nose cone is expensive. On a Falcon 9, it's $6 million. So those, those nose cones, they just let go. $6 million component. A neutron's fairing doesn't actually detach and get lost. It opens like a mouth, like a hungry hippo mouth, and then releases the payload, and it will return back to Earth with that first stage. So it's not a cost to be recovered. It's not something you have to tack on to the bill of the customer. It just ends up being part of the rocket, which is awesome. And another great change in space that we've we've seen a ton of over the last uh, few years now. now. This drive to de-risk also explains like their proprietary launch infrastructure as well, right? They, rocket Lab owns three launch pads in two different countries on two different sides of this planet. Now, this is a massive moat. Obviously, over the last couple of weeks, we've had uh, the U.S. government has been shut down. They were getting close to, well, FAA staff were, some of them were furloughed, some of them weren't showing up to work. And what that meant is, is that the, the FAA had to ask rocket companies, hey, only launch at night. And if that government shutdown went on for much longer, there was a chance that maybe they just say, hey, no more rocket launches in the United States. And if that happens, if that were to happen again, that's fine. Rocket Lab can just keep launching from New Zealand where they have their LC-1. Now, LC2 is in Wallops, Virginia, so they do have launch facilities in the United States, and that's where they're going to launch Neutron from. But they also have, on the opposite side of the Earth, a New Zealand backup, which is where most electron rockets are launched from today. But yeah, let's, uh, on the investment side of things, right, the bull case is clear. They are building a vertically integrated monopoly. They're using high margin space systems division to fund a Neutron build out. Once Neutron is flying, they can offer this single seamless contract from a blank sheet of paper, from an idea all the way to a fully operational constellation in orbit. It's an ironclad business model that no competitor can easily match, but it's going to be a very difficult one to get to, right? And the, and that's the bear case. The big, the, this bear case is, is equally clear. Execution risk. Neutron is a hard problem to solve. It uses a new engine. It's a new architecture. It's already significantly behind schedule. And all this is happening while the company is burning cash. If Neutron fails or it's too late to the game, the entire end-to-end -end vision falls apart. The component business is great, but it might not be enough to support the valuation of a company promising to rival the giants of launch. Which is, 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 is Rocket Lab a picks and shovels component supplier? Is it a costly launch hobby? Or is it the next great end-to-end -end platform for the space economy? And that is a, a fundamental question, right? And it's the kind of fundamental question, the kind of strategic analysis we're gonna cover every week on this channel. It won't just be Rocket Lab, it will be tech in general. So if you're interested, like and subscribe, join Tech Breakdowns, go to techbreakdowns.com where we do have write-ups as well. Let me know your thoughts on Rocket Lab in the comments below. I am very bullish on the future of this company. I am an investor in Rocket Lab. I hold a good amount of stock. I've enjoyed the ride up. I'm not enjoying the ride down quite as much, but it is a company that I believe has a very promising future. So uh, yeah, don't attack me and say, hey, you're so bearish. No, I'm not. I actually love Rocket Lab. I'm very bullish on the company and believe it has a great future ahead of it. But I do like to share these breakdowns and share my thoughts and feelings about like the different directions these companies could take. So yeah, if you enjoyed the video, please let me know. Drop a comment, leave a like, subscribe if you are interested in that, or head over to techbreakdowns.com for full write-ups. We'll be back weekly with different videos covering the tech industry, the tech business, tech economy, all that sort of stuff. I will see you next time. Have a good one.